Delhi. Uh, Professor Mukherjee, of course, needs no introduction. I'm sure all of us who are invested in thinking about the global contours of art history are familiar with Professor Mukherjee's work, including her recent essay in the Art Bulletin where she presented local spatialities as the ground from which divergent claims to art history can unsettle older universalizing narratives. This questioning of the canon has been, at least for me, a critical force in Parul's work on comparative aesthetics, critical art historiography, globalization, and contemporary Asian art. Parul's publications are expansive, and to rehearse them would mean I speak more than you would like me to. And we are all eager to listen to Parul speak. Nonetheless, I take the liberty of highlighting a few. Along with a number of seminal essays, her publications include a critical edition of the Chitra Sutra, co-edited volumes including Towards a New Art History, Studies in Indian Art, Influx, Contemporary Art in Asia, an ASA volume on art and aesthetics in a globalizing world, and 20th century Indian art, co-edited co -edited with Parthometer and others. As a Clark Fellow this fall, Parul is currently working on performative mimesis in Sanskrit aesthetics. She will be speaking on this theme tomorrow evening at the Institute for South Asian Studies. Her talk today focuses on art history in India, art history and its discontents in the age of globalization. But before I hand over the podium to Parul, I want to thank the Department of History of Art, the Institute for South Asian Studies, and the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies for making this event possible. We also have the History of Art annual newsletter and the Institute for South Asian Studies annual research note written by HOA graduate students at the back there. Please take a copy. It will give you a sense of the fabulous art history programs that we do on campus here. But without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Pavel. Thank you, Sagato, for this very generous introduction. And congratulations for finally being able to refer to me by my first name. <laughs> uh, so today's uh, talk is very much to do with my uh, uh, almost uh, long-term interest in globalization and its impact on our theory and our practice. Uh, today, uh, the talk is going to focus on um, uh, this disciplinary history of art history in India. And I'm going to highlight some important moments within that history. So the central question with which I'll start is, what becomes of art history when the world shrinks into a planet? Globalization has posed a challenge as much to Eurocentric art history in the West as to nationalist art history in India. So the question is, how does one evolve a narrative for Indian art when the logic of the narrative itself is at stake? Drawing from current debates around impact of globalization on art history and on art writing, I will assess their relevance for Indian art history and art practice. I will also examine how the cultural studies turn, which has been uh, there since 1980s, has uh, helped to widen the constituency of art objects via an anthropological understanding of art and how this has paved way towards new art history and finally for visual studies in its wake. This paper will explore the relationship between contemporary art practice and the critical tools of art history via the political and argue for a closer sync between uh, the two as contemporary art with its experiments with temporality and spatiality more in tune with globalized times has much to offer to art history and visual studies. The anthropological turn has also made us relook at art historiography and its two axes of mapping through time and space. Is there a shift from the when to the where of art history in contemporary art historiography? And what does it say about the state of art history uh, with this focus on India? Uh, art history, as you all know, uh, has been a product of European enlightenment and imperialism at once. It rose in around late 18th century when Europe began to consolidate itself as different nation states. 
In that sense, it was art history that offered an ideological edifice. Of course, art history is one of the ideological edifices through national art histories by which various geographies came to be identified. When art history did travel to India under the ages of colonialism, uh, it entered India with a civilizing mission to reform native taste in art and culture through establishment of art schools. We are all too familiar with the debates around the presence and absence of fine arts as a category in Indian art. Once the cultural nationalists were able to establish with the help of uh, fellow orientalists that not only did fine arts have a long hoary past, but this past needed to be judged through a culturally uh, relevant yardstick. That an important move towards decolonizing art history was made by none other than the imposing figure of Ananda Kumara Swami. Because I'll show you some uh, interesting photographs of Kumara Swami. This, tells, this quotation tells you something about his desire to represent himself as an Avalokiteshwara. <laughs> And this is even uh, more striking, where he fashions his own identity as a rasika, as a, as a uh, connoisseur, as an esthete of Indian art. And just briefly this slide uh, to give you an idea of the kind of colonial representation with which Kumar Swami had to constantly battle. And this uh, quotation, it almost uh, you know, encapsulates the, the, the kind of the colonial representation that was surrounding interpretation of Indian art. Uh, George Birdwood, he was now is notorious for this quotation. Uh, he says, the monstrous shape of the Puranic deities are unsuitable for the higher forms of artistic representation. And this is probably why sculpture and painting are unknown as fine arts in India. And finally, uh, even more uh, of a quotable quote where he compares this, uh, uh, this work, which is supposed to stand for classicism in Indian art, to a boiled suet pudding. And uh, of course, this created such an outrage uh, at that time that a stalwart figure like Kumar Swami immediately jumped to defense of Indian art. Now, the central concern which was at that time being debated was the presence or absence of naturalism in Indian art. So if naturalism was a convenient yardstick with its inbuilt, inbuilt chronology to condemn Indian art for its anatomical inaccuracies used by colonial art critics, transcendentalism emerges as an alternative model, which informed the nationalist narrative of writing art history. The upshot of this move was that religion became an overarching framework to view all facets of Indian art and Indian nation state of a primary prism through which uh, cultural practices could be assessed. What was overlooked was, of course, that current geographical boundary of India was itself a historical formation and had little validity for earlier historical periods that were far more transcultural, transregional, connected through trade, religion, and of course, wars. So today it is time to rethink narrative strategies of art historiography when contemporary global condition blurs national boundaries as the world connects through trade, migration of people, goods, images, ideas, and art practice. And art practice imagines the world differently through the virtual space of the internet and the mobility of artists and the curators. Today, the very task of representation central to art writing and art practice itself has fallen under scrutiny. Just as art history in the West passed through disciplinary crisis when elitism of, say, formalism came under scrutiny and politics of representation was foregrounded, around gender, sexuality, class, art history experienced similar conversions around the close of the 20th century in India. In the case of the latter, that is Indian art history, it was the elitism of Indian art history with its strong Brahminical bias that had invited contention from the new art historians. Uh, I can't resist showing this photograph, which uh, it's a rare photograph of an art history class as early as 1925 in Shantani Ketan. And uh, it's uh, quite reassuring to see a lot of women who were in the classroom. And this was a time when practical teaching and theory, they were actually going hand in hand. But we'll quickly move back to uh, 
the 60s moment, which is going to be my point of departure for my argument. As a case in point, let me take you back to such a scenario in 1980s in Baroda, when art practice revealed a different dynamics and declared its disjunction with earlier practice, while art theory lagged behind and could not quite fit into the contemporary space. Uh, in terms of art practice, these artists who for, form part of uh, the Baroda narrative group, uh, they have, of course, they pose in their practice compelling critique of a Eurocentric internationalism and engage with the local within a cosmopolitan framework. Uh, just a brief idea about the art practice, the two works by, uh, one work each by Gubin Khakar and Ghulam Mohammed Sheikh. They engage with the local within a cosmopolitan framework. In place of grand narratives of nationalist allegories, the artists fashioned fractured tales that broke up linearity of narration and in a preliminary sense addressed the question of public sphere, both in terms of depiction, where you would have protagonists which are, who are actually marked by their class, as never before, as well as in terms of address, the way a viewing public was imagined. Out of sync with its time was the discipline of art history that still uncritically was lumbering under the colonial and nationalist legacy of connoisseurship, stylistic analysis, search for Indianness, and the rare masterpieces. The Hegelian imperative of tracing art across history as a story of progress, compounded by Kumaraswamian transcendentalism, continued to impel the discipline forward. While art writing on contemporary art was getting contestatory, in which Nita Kapoor's place for people, uh, this, uh, to which these artists belonged in 1981, marked a significant intervention. Art history was caught in historicism and remained insular from radical developments in social sciences, particularly linguistics, cultural anthropology, and philosophy. While in 1980s, Rolla Barth and John Berger were held up as inspiring uh, figures in art practice and art criticism, whose writings introduced semiotics and Marxism into debates on culture. Art history opened its frontiers to structural anthropology gingerly. <laughs> Ancient myths and epics attracted attention as a compelling uh, cultural force, driving pre-modern narratives in painting and sculpture. This is an interesting slide of uh, one of the first site-specific seminars which took place um, and it would be around 1986. So since the conference was on Elora, the idea was to you know, organize it in the site itself. And you can see Professor Parimu in the center. Largely drawing inspiration from Levi Strauss's methodology, Ratan Parimu, assisted by his team of researchers, turned to Vaishnavism as an overarching framework for studying Indian painting and culture in the shift from formalistic analysis to content study, the influence of Irving Panofsky was critical. What was missing in the way art history as a discipline was structured was any concern with the political. While in the West, the discipline underwent convergence with the Marxist and feminist questioning, the elitism of art history, and raising the question of politics of representation, the practice of art history in India continued unruffled. Within the pedagogic practice, Art history and art criticism were offered as separate disciplines that further deepened the divide separating art history as historical and a discipline that engaged only with pre-modern and art criticism that expunged itself from history and trained to build tunnel vision to look only at the contemporary. It was this separation between the historical and the critical that did not allow the political to feature as a main concern. Again, the political emerges uh, first in discourse centered around art practice. I trace the political uh, to this particular moment and the catalog essay written by Kita Kapoor called Place for People. Uh, so around which a few decolonizing moves were made. It begins by undoing the construct of Indian identity embedded in colonial and nationalist art historiography around the polarity of materialist West and transcendental India. It is striking how an essay on contemporary art devotes large section to an art historical narrative that reaches back to Indus Valley civilization. Kapoor seeks to establish a lineage of contemporary art practice that had rehabilitated the figurative in art. 
It revisited the past to recover the depiction of everyday life in free modern art. <coughs> it is interesting how contemporary art practice that enshrined the narrative and discovered the public in its midst compelled the art critic and art historian to engage with past traditions from similar lens. The project is to revisit the past to make it directly usable in contemporary times and to free Indian artists from Western tutelage on one hand and charges of derivativeness on the other. Its more radical intent, intent lay more in the way in which it wanted the people to come back uh, into the pictures and tell the stories. This is a quotation from Gita Kapoor's writing. She says, let people come back into the pictures and tell the stories, unquote. <coughs> Realizing that the political cannot inhere only in allowing people to enter the frame of paintings and be confined to the subject matter, Kapoor invokes Herbert Marcus's notion of affirmative culture, which is not directed at the role of the art gallery or art gallery system and the market as agents of affirmation, but more a reflection on the elite class that she and the artist for place for people themselves belonged. So I'm uh, just pointing out the, the irony of the way in which Gita Kapoor uses um, Marcus's affirmative culture, which is used by him as a critical category, but it's actually appropriated as, um, as, a, as a positive uh, you know, concept. Such an understanding of the political, even if ensconced within the leftist discourse, was declared as inadequate by the members of the Kerala radicals, who in the mid 90s deployed leftist critical tools to offer an institutional critique. So, the first group which began to oppose uh, the place for people ideology were the Kerala radicals. So this is a photograph of the leading uh, artist who kind of spearheaded the movement, Krishna Kumar. <coughs> who in the mid-1980s deployed leftist critical tools to offer an institutional critique. So this is the first time really that an artist offers an institutional critique. In their manifesto, uh, which was written by Anita Dube, who is now an artist in her own right, uh, they underlined praxis as the key word while challenging the art world and questioning the easy coexistence of the leftist discourse and the elitism of the art public. The commodification of art and its complicity with the capitalist economy was condemned and search for alternative space for art practice was uh, sought out. The 1990s was also a decade of discovery of the alliance of post-structuralism, post-colonialism, cultural studies, when exchanges took place between departments of English and art history. And they were energizing debates and giving rise to cross-cultural or cross-disciplinary conversations. That also led to a sense of disciplinary crisis. These debates grew out of an increasing discomfort with the framework of art history that could scarcely explain the field of the visual in our own time. A number of conferences were held around the themes of politics of representation, gender, sexuality, uh, that strongly registered dissatisfaction with the state of art history that had celebrated a humanist and politically neutral position. It was clear that given the disciplinary framework were inadequate in accommodating interrogation of the discipline itself. That's when the term new art history began to gain currency despite our discomfort with the term new and its market savvy uh, implication of novelty. When the discipline undertakes an interrogation of its own tools and methodology and underlines a theoretical inadequacy, it makes a shift from both colonial and nationalist legacies. Emerging out of a similar dissatisfaction with conventional art history was the Inceptional School of Arts and Aesthetics, set up in JNU in 2001. It introduced, in the place of art history, visual studies, theater and performance <coughs> studies, and later cinema studies. Visual studies formally spelled the demise of nomenclature, art history, or history of art. Given its grounding in anthropological definition of art, inclusion of aesthetics in the naming of the school has periodically come under the scanner for its implication of high art. I remember when I joined in 2006, uh, School of Art and Aesthetics, uh, there was intense sense of hostility coming from different schools in the same university. And um, all the time we were almost forced to justify the term aesthetics, which was set aside or dismissed as very elitist. And for me, it was a great relief to actually be able to uh, hold up the Rossier's politics of aesthetics and say, look, look up your Rossier. 
In all the three fields, the nationalist histories have been problematized, and it has instead focused on popular culture, public sphere, institutional frameworks for art, museum studies, minor art, Dalit visual culture, photography, and the relationship to cinema and performative tradition. And this is just a uh, slide from one of the international conferences that which, were, which was held to celebrate 100 years of Indian Cinema School of Arts and Aesthetics. Uh, in, in the West, the theme of globalization has powerfully captured the imagination of many leading art historians and curators, and it has compelled many to envisage the end of hegemony of canons of Western art history. Just a quotation from uh, the curators of uh, the uh, Global Contemporary Exhibition at Karlsruhe, uh, Focus and Fan Votes. And just this is a small quotation read out. With the upheavals coming in the wake of globalization and its attendant movement of the past 20 years, the era has witnessed the prevalence of Western canon in art history. The era that witnessed the prevalence of Western art history canons has come to a close. A global contemporary of diverse origins has taken its place." Unquote. It has not only given credence to multiple modernisms that have existed in different parts of the world, but also provincialized the master art historical narrative and its Euro-American prominence as originary. As far as the contemporary art scene is concerned, it has spawned the recognition of the global contemporary and opened doors to discourse of multiculturalism to enter art writing. And James Elfin's story of art encapsulates one such moment in his attempt to counter Eurocentricism in Western art history. However, Elkins articulates, articulates a challenge posed by multiculturalism to art history as how to write art history outside the narrative framework. That's a central question that he keeps raising all through that book. Can art history that discounts the narrative still be considered as art history? Art history in the narrative mode privileges the linear format and hence risks creating hierarchy. So when we question Eurocentric art histories like E. H. Gombrich's The Story of Art for underrepresentation of non-Western art histories, the same critical gaze has to be directed at Indian art histories, which is no less exempt from the rot of the internal others, the subalterns in various registers along the axis of gender, class, caste, region, religion, sexuality, women artists, the regional modernist, women regional modernist, Dalit artists, women Dalit artists, gay lesbian artists, and so on. These social groups hardly found any space within the Nehruvian socialist paradigm and the overarching frame of the national modern. In the 1990s, the sheer complexity of identity politics unleashed by postmodernism in the West was related with the tyranny of the temporal and space was offered as a vector more accommodating of cultural difference. The emerging primacy of space over time is best witnessed in David Summer's Real Spaces as an attempt to rewrite global art history. From the post-colonial perspective, is it possible to bypass the temporal and privilege a spatial register to rewrite history of art in India? Is space any less hierarchical than time? To give an example of historical narrative on Indian art, let me turn to Gita Kapoor's When Was Modernism. Will its rewriting in terms of where was modernism redress its politics of representation? Will the where in place of when yield answers that are region specific, escape the compulsions of linear logic of time, and offer a more democratic space to the cultural others? For an alternative teleology, one can turn to contemporary art practice. I will focus on what I identify as two key major thematics by which temporality and spatiality have been radically imagined or reimagined. And those two tropes are artist as ethnographer and history as archive. Art practice today offers several lessons to art history in the way it upturns standard notions of time and space. The paralyzing binary between tradition and modernity that for decades underwrote the historiography of modern art gets undone by the motion of the archive that contemporary artists have invoked. So I'll be looking at uh, these uh, four artists and one uh, collective. Since the turn of 21st century, many contemporary artists in India as elsewhere 
have begun to view their practice from an anthropological lens. Let me focus on some of these artists who fall in this category. We start with Pushpamala uh, and Pushpamala, a Bangalore-based artist. In 2000, Pushpamala took a project of photo performance entitled Native Women of South India, Manners and Customs. The title itself resonates with the colonial system of classification. In this work, not only does performance make photography, Pushpamala overtly self-acknowledges in the way she refashions her body as a native by costume, posture, gaze, even skin color. She had to darken her skin color uh, to mimic the colonial representation of Toda tribal woman. Visiting the colonial archive, she sets up the relationship between the original, itself a representation, and her copy. The real subject of the photograph becomes, in a sense, artist critical scrutiny of the anthropological gaze. For Pushpamala, the only way to undo the logic of the anthropological gaze is by inhabiting the space of the native, by staging a confrontation with the colonial gaze, and excessively submitting to it. In this carefully fashioned vis en scene, she juxtaposes documentation with masquerade, deconstructing one with the help of the other, and thus playing with the distance between the self and the other, the historical and the contemporary, reality and fiction. And her stress on South Indian women also questions the imagination governing the national model, which had no truck with regional specificity. In India, I mean, everybody was in, forced to imagine herself or himself under the overarching you know, nomenclature of India. Uh, this is uh, an example from her Rasa series where, as a contemporary artist, she revisits uh, the Navarasa, the nine aesthetic uh, sentiments, and uh, of course gives it a contemporary twist. In the other spectrum lies a revisiting of classical Indian aesthetics encapsulated by the nine aesthetic emotions or Navarasa. In the Navarasa series, Pushumara revisits the classical past and the aesthetic theory of rasa around 5th century Christian era to create contemporary allegories. This past is not accessed under the sign of Indian identity, but reflected through cinematic genre of melodrama and India's Islamic heritage. Revisiting of the past has also been the prerogative of most modernists in India, but rarely accomplished through technological mediation of photography and performative uh, performative refashioning of artist's own body. The ethnographic turn in contemporary art practice can also be seen in Anup Matthews' uh, work titled Metropolitan. It's a series with, uh, is a catalog of bishops in front of a variety of edifices. What at first glance appears to be a bland and prosaic interest in the everyday is actually informed by Ardo's research. In this series, when Matthews is revisiting a forgotten archive or grasping the present moment, he re readily assumes the role of an ethnographer, traveling not so much across time as across places, in search of a narrative uh, strand linking people in different locations. The elaborate paraphernalia, paraphernalia of ecclesiastical power, ostensibly demonstrated in portraits, turns each bishop's posture of authority into an iterative performative mode. The, the iconography speaks not only of cultural hybridity of brown bodies wearing European costumes, but also of the orchestrated globalized network within Christian institutions around the world. Incongruity and Masquerade powerfully informed Nikhil Chopra's series. This is part of Yogara Chitrakar, memory drawing. The photographic stills capture live performances through which a fictional character of the artist's creation enters into everyday uh, performing daily activities like washing, eating, cleaning, shaving, dressing, and so on. His character, uh, called Yogra Chitrakar, is strongly reminiscent of India's pioneering proto-modernist uh, artist, Raja Ravi Varma, who was the first painter to indigenize Victorian oil painting by using the medium to depict scenes from classical epics of India like Ramayana and Mahabharata. The word Chitrakar is a nomenclature usually reserved for village artists, so it's a misnomer for the persona created by Chopra, which is semi-fictitious and semi-autobiographical, partly based on his grandfather who studied at Goldsmiths College and partly imagined the genre of imperial portraiture that inspired many of Maharaja in colonial India to commission a portrait that mimicked the work of Western masters. 
Mimicry for Chopra becomes a ploy not only to bring to life contemporary flannel, but also to create a deliberate disjunction between time and space as we follow the journey of the anachronistic painter Chitrakar across different geographies and identities. Each geography takes the form of a backdrop against which the artist poses. Chopra posits anachronism as a creative way of complicating temporality by mixing up, uh, mixing up axes of time and space and usurping what was earlier the prerogative of a European explorer. Likewise, the Reserve Army by Rux Media Collective, which is my uh, second last example, last example, destabilizes temporality through archive. So I'll quickly show you the work before we come back to the source of inspiration. Uh, Paying a tribute to India's first modernist sculptor, Ramki Karvej, who is the uh, sculptor of these two works, the Rux Media Collective set up the dialogue through discourse and artwork, creating yet another form of entangled uh, temporality. Their discourse is constituted of excerpts on Yaksha and Yakshi, uh, the semi-divine guardians from Mahabharata. In other words, the discourse and practice acquire shape as palimpsest of citations both in visual and textual registers. Traditionally, Yaksha and Yakshi were guardians of wealth who were notorious for asking difficult questions to travelers to protect hidden treasure. When Ram Kinkar, uh, the sculpture of these two works, was commissioned to make public sculpture to adorn portals of Reserve Bank of India in the first decade of formation of Indian Republic, he chose a monumental image of a Yaksha and Yakshi on both sides of the main gate. These two iconic images are taken by Rux Media Collective as two gigantic question marks frozen in stone. And the questions they ask are, how is money to be guarded? And to what purpose? <laughs> so I'm just going to uh, enact the conversation that they uh, set up between themselves and the Yaksha and Yakshi. The opening <coughs> question is from Aranya Parva, Mahabharat. Yaksha, in Sanskrit he says, Mrita Katam Yat Purusha, when is a man as good as dead? Yudhishthir, he is one of the five uh, brothers, uh, Pandava brothers. He says, Mrita Daridra Purusha, a poor man is a dead man. Yaksha, what is more precious than gold, as worthless as scrap of paper, heavier than stone, faster than the wind, slower than a turtle, lighter than a feather, as deadly as poison, and as welcome as a blessing? Answer by Rux is a banknote. <laughs> because it can be valuable and worthless. Because it can be sluggish and volatile. Because it can weigh you down with debt or set you free. Because it can kill you or save you. Because it can kill you by saving you. <laughs> then Yaksha. When money talks, who listens? Rux. The deaf hear, the blind see, the wise man goes mad, the mad woman goes to her senses. Misers become poets, artists become mathematicians, thieves pray, holy men babble. <laughs> In response to Ram Pinkal Bejas, Rakshan Yakshi, which you just saw, uh, the collective created a fiberglass version of the same, ornamenting them with garlands made out of rupee notes as they hang around in the neck. Barbed wire, waistband, substituting stone with fiberglass and sand they bring down the size to human scale and take off their pedestals. As they multiply in number and march as clones, in the background you can see multiple copies receding in, uh, in infinity. The traditional role of asking difficult questions gets lost in the exuberance and euphoria, and they become mere instruments for guarding the flow of capital. Staging a close proximity of the sacred and the profane, the mythical and the world of capital, they not only fuse temporalities, but hollow out claims of golden past and dreams of utopia. And uh, my sec, I mean, this is the last artist I'll be focusing on. This is uh, called Sphere by Jagannath Panda. Uh, he's basically got uh, this collage of uh, newspaper cuttings of words which are made to run like, you know, linear patterns across the globe. Sphere by Jagannath Panda highlights the connectivity of the world through networks of information highways that do not map on political divisions of the nation state. 
In its very imaginary, it exemplifies cultural flows of post-national art history, which need not be about contemporary world, but at any given historical point. And this is our concluding uh, image. Like the 1980s moment, there seems to arise a new disjunction between art practice and art theory. What makes theorization about cultural practice within art history challenging is that the very terms of debate have lost stable terms of reference, frame of reference. Art, art history, aesthetics. Art history still seems to be caught in the binarism between tradition and modernity. And it is in the realm of art practice that the opposition between the local and the global, center and periphery, theory and practice are increasingly being subverted. Today, some of the contemporary artists engage with temporality far more experimentally than art historians and art critics. Given the loss of stable meanings enjoyed earlier by terms like art, aesthetics, history, does art history relinquish its critical tools or refashion them by paying close attention to the material and conceptual frameworks engaged by contemporary artists? For this productive encounter to happen, the anthropo anthropological turn in art practice has to be assessed critically. When contemporary artists assume the role of an ethnographer, does it serve to undo the authority of the artist or let them lapse into narcissism of the self? This is something Hal Foster has already uh, alerted us about. The other paradox of contemporary art needs to be examined. The more contemporary art practice dissolves the boundaries between media and at times even succeeds to unsettle the stable identity of the artist, the more the onus of offering rep, uh, interpretation of these heterogeneous practices rests upon the curator. In such a situation, the figure of the curator emerges as an authoritative figure that traverses the globe, forming networks uh, with what John Clark has termed as the curatoriate. So I'll conclude with a recent work by Jagannath Panda called The Cult and the Appearance Three, and it is uh, interesting that I discovered later that this work is right now in San Francisco Museum. Thus the mythical bird of kite that hovers across cartography of laboring bodies allegorize the form of contemporary art history, uh, allegorize the form contemporary art history may take as it dislodges itself from territoriality of uh, national art history. That's the question I'm asking. The high point from which it surveys the world is not some Hegelian vantage point that privileges Euro-American terrain, but the flight, but the kite flaunts over its wings multiple national flags. I don't know if you can see them on both sides. They are quite small, just above the wings. And brings into view scenes of conflict over territoriality, laboring bodies, incom incomplete bridges, perhaps a bridge that needs to be built between contemporary art practice and art theory. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for this wonderful talk. Should we just open it up for a question and answer discussion session? Sure. I have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. I'll jump in. So um, I think uh, the question that I sort of had was the relationship between the subaltern studies collective and thinking about Gita Kapoor's plea about letting the people come back. Mm -hmm. And again, Ronald Chukbuho in the 70s would also make such a claim in terms of the turn in history writing in South Asia. So I wonder how history writing as a discipline, that the great transformations that happened in the 70s, how did it impact, let's say, art history, or even, let's say, art praxis? So mm -hmm. there would you fit subaltern studies collective as the most important moment in historiography of history writing in terms of the mm -hmm. earlier narrative. I, I think while uh, subaltern studies has really brought about a, a change in, you know, complete sort of almost a paradigm shift in the way in which one is talking about class, uh, but one very important aspect which they did not engage with directly, uh, that's the question of caste. And I think that is something which new art historians are taking very seriously. And that has been a very productive, that has opened up a productive terrain to talk about exclusion and also to uh, revisit earlier moments and to question about why uh, certain kind of privileging which was done uh, and to connect that with 
the identity of these art historians themselves. Um, and in terms, of course, one can talk about impact of subaltern studies through cultural studies. I think cultural studies turn has been very, very important, almost a game changer, and um, and which has really opened up, or rather, as I said, the constituency of what you understand as art object that has expanded, and of course, which with with that uh, popular visual culture becomes a very important field, which was never uh, taken seriously. In fact, when I was a, a faculty member in, in Baroda, there was a huge controversy about a dissertation, dissertation topic, which one of our MA students wanted to take up, Anamar Chitra Katha. Mm -hmm. And we all had to kind of constantly justify the subject matter. So there was a clear line of division between the old heart and people who thought differently. It's, it's a very broad question that you've raised, so I think I can slowly, I mean, with, with help of more questions, I can come back to it. So this is sort of a broad question, but I'm studying performance studies at Berkeley, and I want to know a little bit more about the JNU School of Performance Studies and what its main concerns are. Uh -huh. uh, well, it is, the main uh, thrust is on theoretical and historical understanding of performance <coughs> art through history and also it has a com contemporary component. Um, and of course there is a problem which we are trying to uh, address is we don't really deal with practice mm -hmm. and which sometimes creates a problem. So very often we invite uh, performers to come and have old workshop so that there's some kind of a dialogue which happens between the two. Uh, Rustam Bharucha has joined us recently and of course he has uh, really uh, underlined uh, the importance of critique of nationalism mm -hmm. and he is very, very critical of globalization as such, which he tries to uh, sort of pit it against the local. And uh, he, for him globalization can never really uh, take us to a productive space, it is something to be resisted. I think, I think over there we should be raised. I'm doing this is that um, the challenge to um, <coughs> classical art history and perhaps the old kind of again and aesthetics and so forth. So what was happening in the post-colonial period in your narrative? But you know, how well what um, the results of the setting up our schools and so was precisely to as with Kumaraswani as a as a response to the orientalization and the judgment and the industrial school of arts and so forth that we from there. But but there were the Tagores as well and, and, and that um, you know getting stuff from Japan and so forth, during or not or not, or Mother India and so forth. Wouldn't you see that embedded in that were counter narratives. These were there were challenges to the prevailing art sure. history, not not just the changes in forms, the Kalikat, the Kalikat babies and so on. And, and what happened to Raza and Tayab and, and a whole lot of these uh, modernist uh, you know, Marxist socialist artists way, way before Kumar, um, in the nineteen twenties and thirties and so on. I would have thought that there was there was already already in their, in their performance, mm -hmm. in, their, in their artwork, a, a critique that was already happening, but not necessarily articulated as such at the time, other than a handful of few. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, the reason uh, why I, my narrative took this, this form is also because I was keeping uh, my main focus on the, the career taken by art history as a discipline. So I was narrating the the history of art history as a discipline in India, which is why I had to kind of privilege certain moments where I thought that there was a very interesting conversation or lack of conversation between art practice and art, art historians. That's the reason. And I, I'm glad you talked about the earlier moments. Of course, I mean, uh, the book that I'm currently uh, co-editing with Parthamitar and Raki Balram, it's a, now becoming a 
humongous volume. It's called 20th Century Indian Art. And we are constantly having to deal with the problem that you're raising. And one way of dealing with it is, um, in my section, I have uh, created a distinction between post-colonial, with hyphen, and without hyphen. The one with hyphen would mean that there was a clear divide between the pre-47 moment and post-47. Of course, it was a significant event, and it, in a sense, does inform art practice and art writing. But one can't just privilege, one can't say it so simplistically, which is why I've also coined, not coined, but I've also used the term post-colonial without the hyphen, precisely talk about earlier moments, like so that one can actually give history of materialistic practice. So one example of this decolonizing move would be the time when it was decided in Shantaniketan that we are not going to uh, embrace oil painting. Instead, we'll turn to temp tempera or panel painting and all. And of course, the whole pan-Asian aesthetics which was evoked. So that, for me, it's a very important decolonizing move which was made, and which has to be, of course, mapped onto our history. So that volume gives me a larger scope to bring in all these aspects that you brought, brought up just now. Oh, Harsha, <coughs> I just want to go back a little bit to the, the, the kind of the, the perhaps inspiration of Shugata's remark about the uh, Sarvatham school as a kind of parallel. So um, you spoke about the, these uh, contemporary moves toward inclusivity about caste. Mm -hmm. And then this brings up these issues of the subaltern. Can the subaltern speak, or can the subaltern be an art critic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that sort of thing? So, so how does that actually work in the addressing of caste? You just take, for example, uh, Panda's piece, which is now in global mm -hmm. elite circulation. It's in the Asian Art Museum in mm -hmm. San Francisco, mm -hmm. uh, and presumably it, it belongs to a, a category which is either in the museums or in the galleries mm -hmm. in the metros mm -hmm. now. So, what what is its engagement with the issue of caste? Yeah, it's think? actually very. Uh, ironical uh, if one notes the fact that as far as Dalit art is concerned, I was talking to Sabi Savarkar, who, is, who also projects himself as India's first Dalit artist. I mean, I have problems with that proclamation, uh, but I actually curated an exhibition of his work in Lalit Kala, and there was a lot of resistance. It was not easy at all. And uh, I remember when I was writing the catalog essay, a um, lot of people came up to me and said, uh, excuse me, how, how do you think you have the right to work on this exhibition and curate it, considering the fact that your double-barreled name reveals your Brahminic identity? So I said, no, don't give me that. I, I don't think you have to be a woman to be a feminist. In that sense, you don't have to belong to a Dalit uh, caste to be able to give us authentic narrative. So these are the problems that one constantly faces. And the ironical part is, Sabi told me this, that most of his works are in private collection uh, uh, of collectors who are based outside the country. There are very few collectors within the country who are actually proud to uh, buy his works. Um, so it is, it is an ongoing struggle for them. And for the, they look at global, as, as a, not as a pejor pejorative term at all, but as, as a very, very liberating space where they there's a possibility of finding recognition. Anka, Tasha, and uh, Blake. Mm. Uh, so thank you for this great talk, and in particular, the very compelling and uh, succinct thought experiment, which is, is there a shift from the when to the where? So you posted it as perhaps it has already happened, but it was also a kind of challenge to imagine mm -hmm. the possibility of, of that occurring. And I took that challenge, and then you showed us the images and it was striking that so many of them were uh, recreations or restagings of historic photographs which clearly play with the temporal aspect but do you see these levers as uh, connected do you see the uh, return to time or the assertion of a, a different temporal relationship to also destabilize mm -hmm. geographical mm -hmm. constraints and yeah I think what I find very interesting compelling about their experiment with speciality and temporality is the way, for example, um, Nikhil Chopra, he privileges uh, anachronism. So that becomes a very interesting way of questioning chronology itself, because you are literally working against the linear logic and turning that into uh, some kind of a, a conceptual virtue. Um, 
And of course, see, space and time, no matter how, for the sake of classification and discourse, we treat them as separate. But in a certain sense, they have to overlap. So there's no pure way of just talking about spatiality without invoking time. But what I want to say is through the experiments with spatiality, a new notion of temporality does emerge. But the question that you're raising is interesting. How, how do they speak to each other in terms of these, these strategies? That is something which uh, I think I would like to, yeah, would like to address and take it further. I had not thought of it yet. Thanks. My question in a sense is really betting on the on the question that was asked earlier about uh, Indian art in the say, first half of the 20th century. And I thought you answered it very well by saying that your primary goal was to address art history rather than the history of artistic production. Uh, but the one lacuna that might have been filled recently is has been has been written by one of your colleagues whom you just mentioned, which is part of the book, The Triumph of Modernism. Uh -huh. And I wanted to raise one particular conceptual tool that he uses in that book, which in some ways is in a sense a kind of prehistory to what you might consider the current moment of globalization. And that is a term that he uses, which is a kind of critical notion of cosmopolitanism. Right? And he uses the term cosmopolitanism as a means of getting beyond the binarism of either the colonial and the national, or the imperial and the national, or indeed even the local and the global. Uh, and while it's certainly true that most of the examples that he gives are of relatively elite artists who are hooked into what he calls the virtual cosmopolis, connecting Kolkata to London and to Europe, I'm wondering if in the, in the current moment of India's insertion into this global space, whether this notion, critical notion of the cosmopolitan can still have some value, or are you rather on Rustam Bharuch's side that the local is the only side of resistance? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, I think um, these terms have to be used very cautiously mm -hmm. because cosmopolitan is not the same as the global, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is why I think Parthamit is using it in, in a, for an earlier context. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, the whole idea of who is allowed to travel, who has the means to travel and to get that global exposure, was, uh, you know, it was restricted to the, to the elitist class. Um, I mean, I also have a lot of problems with uh, some of my colleagues uh, who uh, keep saying that, oh, you people talk about globalization, but don't you think it, it has always happened in the past, you know, right from Gandhara times and all? I said, no. There are certain things which are unprecedented. Of course, people have traveled, goods have moved from one place to the other, but what is unprecedented <coughs> is the sheer speed, the mass, the volume of, you know, uh, not just volume, technology which enables certain things which were absolutely uh, unthinkable earlier. So one has to accept the fact that there is a difference. Uh, whether cosmopolitan can be used, uh, can be again reappropriated uh, for contemporary use, um, I suppose one can because one has to also, again, see, just because globalization is there to stay does not mean that now everybody has equal access to everything. There is that social hierarchy remain. And perhaps there, the cosmopolitan can be reused to be able to uh, kind of annotate the, the hierarchies which are still there. Um. Just a question about language choice in this discourse. You've shown a very sensitive concern for dominance, modes of exclusion, the capacity to order discourse around these artworks. Uh, also their circulation and their display. Where is the space for vernaculars in these concerns? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, well, um, I mean, if I can give an example of Jagannath Panda, who hails from Burissa and who comes from a rural background, but of course he has uh, uh, art education in a place like Baroda, which kind of <laughs> then lifts him to another level. But the question of vernacular is uh, very much to be addressed. And I think it's right now it's being addressed in the realm of folk and tribal art. Mm. Uh, which I'm sure that's not the only terrain it, it can be raised, but um, there's an increasing awareness of the deep divide between here the cosmopolitan and the vernacular. The, the fact that they belong to two different constituencies, which don't speak to each other, is actually part of the problem that contemporary India is facing. 
And sometimes I often think that a place like Delhi, which is now becoming notorious for violence, one of the reasons why such things are happening in Delhi is precisely because here you have these two Indias, Bharat and India. They are literally grating against each other. And the vernacular and the cosmopolitan, they lead lives as if, I mean, one, one side lives as if the other side does not exist. And that's actually creating a big crisis. So, um, whenever my students uh, you know, take up any research topic, I, this is a standard question I raise them, that you have to go into the question of the vernacular. Because uh, one of the, I think vernacular is also a very important uh, enabling, how do I say, enabling uh, sort of framework is also, uh, I think there's a, if there's a possibility of a new decolonizing way of thinking, it's perhaps via the vernacular. Because otherwise, the urban modern India is, in a sense, so already so deeply colonized that it's very difficult to think against the grain. So vernacular is a positive space for me to think through. I was just thinking, like you know, you worked at Baroda, and it's real personal, like when. I left you, I think, 1994 or something. So um, was that discontent that you left and went to JNU to form all kind of a new? This is becoming very personal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because it's, you know, when you're writing, when you're you know, critiquing, I just wanted to know. Well, it, is, uh, it's, it was just, uh, um, I was trying to teach lesson to MS University by saying that if you're not going to think about my professorship, then I'm going to move elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So I just applied for the heck of applying, mm -hmm. and then I actually got it, and then the vice chancellor tells me that if it's not too late, we, I think your professorship is just around the corner. I said, I'm sorry, now it's too late, I'm going to move on. Mm -hmm. And so it was a, that sort of a decision which I had. And then afterwards, within six months, this whole debacle happened. I don't know how many of you are aware of the fact that our history department in Baroda is not the same because of this terrible controversy which engulfed it following um, uh, this short imprisonment of a student because he made an objectionable uh, work of art and some local polit politician just stormed in and decided that this was uh, not to be permitted and of course it gave rise to nationwide outrage and because of which the dean had to, um, he had to resign, he had to leave the place, he was suspended and of course the, uh, the department had to now take the brunt of it. So it has completely on, a, on its way to decline. I hope that the young uh, students, uh, not students, the colleagues who are looking after it, they're going to make amends and you know bring it back to what it's, it was. But that's how it happened. You know, because I was just relating to like art history department and criticism and like, you know. Um, no, the decision to uh, bring it together was something which was, which happened before the whole crisis. It was something which Shivji, myself, and others felt. This is absolutely mindless. Why are we keeping this as separate? Well, I was not there. Just so yeah, yeah. So this was something which was which had a certain unanimity. Yeah. Well, uh, there are two major uh, figures at that time, apart from uh, Vincent Smith. The other person was George Wood, who, uh, as you know, had written uh, great books on industrial arts of India. And of course, he had great admiration for uh, you know, art and craft of India. But the reason why today we cannot overlook him is because of his provocative remarks, which really impelled uh, somebody like Kumar Swami to take that particular trajectory. So in that sense, uh, his role has, has been very, very uh, historical. We cannot be overlooked. That's why I asked you that. There was a thing when people were, of course, you know, writing huge tomes on, on Indian art and so forth, which influenced a lot of colonial thinking as well. Um, so I think we have to take that into consideration too. 
Yeah, in fact, um, uh, you know, Okakura, uh, who of course had a long association with the Tagores and uh, the cultural nationalist, I was reading his writings and it's interesting how he invokes the authority of Hegel and he tries to do what Hegel did to European art, to Asian art, but in his historiography, he places Japan in the center. <laughs> so there are different ways in which even Hegel can be invoked by the Orient. On that note, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>